God, it is your house. We believe you are moving in our lives and speaking in our lives this morning. Thank you, Lord. We are just praying to you this Easter, God. We're saying thank you. Hosanna, hallelujah. We praise you, God, that you sent your son to die on a cross for us because of our sins. Thank you, Lord. Just bless this message today. Amen. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, so great to see everyone. Um, so first thing, uh, you've seen the stage transform. So Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday is our Easter play. We still have yard signs um, if you want to pick up and put in your yard. Um, great testimony from Pastor Bob at Outreach yesterday about the yard sign. Um, really just hit home. And then also, we had an amazing testimony from Candace who got saved uh, last Easter play. Seeing uh, uh, one of these invitations on the ground, picked it up, came, and got gloriously saved. And like in our church. So like it is, it is amazing. So you can pick up some flyers. You can hand them out. Give them to people in your neighborhood, friends, school. Um, and the yard sign, okay? And then um, secondly, um, if this is your first time at a Greater Grace service, we'd love to welcome you. Um, if you don't mind raising your hand so we can acknowledge you. Anyone the first time? Yes, welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Great to have you here uh, in the third row. Uh, anyone over here? Okay, all right. So that's awesome. Yes. Yeah, we are excited you're here. Um, so this week, our, um, so two announcements in regards to the Easter play. So we need to begin the Easter play practice immediately following service, this service. So um, after service, when we give the benediction, um, you're free to, to, you know, fellowship in the foyer, cafe, but they really need here so that they can practice uh, for the Easter play. And then secondly, um, we're going to have a Good, uh, good Friday service on Friday, um, Easter, um, coming this week, Good Friday service. But for the Good Friday service, the cafe will only be open from 11.45 to 12.45. And then service will be 1 p.m. in the chapel. So if you're uh, in the neighborhood, you're around, please come. Um, it's an amazing time. Um, we'll have communion, prayer, and it'll be a great service, okay? All right, and um, I just want to um, read before we take our offering, um, John chapter 12, um, verses 12 through 19. And um, if they can put them up. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, Thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause... The people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So that's going to be for today's message. And as we think about the offering, we get ready to give. Um, 
let's just give, knowing that this is an amazing season. Palm Sunday, leading up to crucifixion, burial, and then the resurrection of our Savior. This is an amazing season for us because our identities are defined by what happens this week. So we need a great offering. We're doing amazing things. Springtime, resurrection, salvation. So let's give to the Lord cheerfully because he has redeemed our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you we can give. You gave your all. You gave the Son of God for us, identified fully 100%. And you've transformed our lives. And you give us the opportunity to give freely. Not out of duty, but we give freely because you've given us salvation, translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of dear, dear son. We cry out to you, Abba, Father. All this is possible because of the Son of God. So bless this offering for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. It's a mystery of this home.
message uh, in prayer. Uh, I'll pray from here. But before we do, would you, uh, if you feel, free to, you feel free to do this, you could have a prayer with your neighbor, whoever you came with, maybe to the church or you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, you can have a prayer with them for a moment. Uh, pray this way that, you, that we will be able to listen to this message today, okay? Have a prayer with your neighbor. Lord, it's so exciting in our hearts when you speak to us in the Spirit, when your Holy Spirit illuminates our minds and our hearts, and it's real food to us. May our church and then the churches across the country 
and even around the world that this would be happening everywhere, that we would receive spiritual food in our hearts and our minds and have life in the right proportion, understanding you. Bless this message and every listener, and it's a house of miracles. The church is a house of miracles where Christ does things and even heal our bodies and our souls, our will conform to your will, our emotions at peace, our minds illuminated, our relationships healthy, our love in our hearts for people genuine. In your name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. <clears throat> Turn with me to uh, Psalm 118. This is the message on the entry of Christ on the donkey into Jerusalem. There are many parts to our message, and one of them is how important it is to know the Scripture and understand what God is doing. There's an invisible world and then the visible world. And we would like to know about the invisible world. How about you? I'd like to know about the world of the Holy Spirit, the world of faith, heaven. I'd like to know about heaven, angels, promises, Israel, the Messiah. In this text, 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Anybody know what it's speaking about? The stone which the builders refused. Uh, when we were in Israel, we looked at the wall, the wailing wall, and down below in the centuries earlier, even 2,000 years ago, we went down there by a staircase to see the road where Jesus walked along the wall of the temple, and there we saw stones the size of a bus, you know, the size of this scrim here. Uh, 300 tons and more. And there, these stones were fundamental in building because everything squared off by that stone. But the stone had to be tested. Christ was this stone tested by men and discarded. He's not the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. But God has accepted him as the Messiah. And on this stone, he has built a house. And this is marvelous, verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Another way of saying, it is amazing. What men have rejected, God has accepted. Because God knows the Messiah that he's without sin, that he's perfect, he's humble, he's wise. He is the building, the foundation stone for a temple that God builds, not, not made with hands, but made by God, which temple we are. We, there, there are different ways the word is used. One is your body is a temple, and the other way, the, the, the body of Christ made up of many members, not only the people in this room, but all believers throughout history, people that have already gone to heaven, are members of stone, living stones in this temple. And it is amazing in our eyes. I want to show you some amazing things 
about the entry of Christ into Jerusalem on the donkey. We have four parts. One, the people, the crowd, the city, the donkey, and then the king. So that's our brief outline. But we have to say some things to bring us up to speed regarding what we're talking about. So look at verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech ye, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech ye, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That is what they cried out when he was riding the donkey. Blessed is he, the king, the Messiah, that comes in the name of the Lord. Now, not everybody was crying that out. Not everybody was shouting in the streets of Jerusalem, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We don't know how many. We know that Christ was popular. We know that he had done a miracle just recently by raising Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, a small village to the east of Jerusalem. Christ's popularity undoubtedly was profound. He had done many miracles. They knew about him. He had been teaching in the temple. And he was the one that is being accepted by the crowd, by the crowd that is waving palm branches like they are. They are so um, uh, spontaneous and so much under the influence of the Holy Spirit that they immediately recognized and started to worship and wave palm branches and recognize him as the Messiah. And they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to talk about the crowd that's waving, the crowd that's recognizing it, what the event is. If you turn to John 12, where Pastor Eugene read in verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees, went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting from Psalm 118. You see, it's important for you in your mind to have an understanding regarding the big context of life. There is a context for your life, and it's bigger than your 70 years. You were born on this day. You will be dying one day. In that short period of time, you have a context And the context starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we have the first prophecy about the Messiah, that the Messiah would be born of a woman and that the Messiah would crush the head of the serpent. Now, the serpent is the one that deceived Eve in the garden. The serpent is is um, what we recognize as the devil, the serpent in the garden. And, and the promise that the seed of the woman would crush his head. If you crush the head of a serpent, you kill it. So there's a contest. But until that head is crushed, that serpent has seed have seed, not like biologically like snakes that are born and uh, snakes that are, it's a spiritual seed. It's evil. It's a spirit of evil that comes into the lives of people. And we know in history that there are antichrists. There are liars, murderers, destroyers on huge, huge magnitude. Not just a simple guy in a, in a garage somewhere in a local neighborhood. 
He could have the seed of the devil, but there are, they, they may be leaders of millions of people that are the seed of the devil. But when Christ came, he came to be king and to put everything evil under his feet. In doing that, he bruises his heel, meaning the pressure on the head does affect his heel, but it doesn't break a bone. As it says in the Psalms, none of his bones are broken. It doesn't affect his heart, his vitals, like he's alive. He's overcome the evil. He crushed the serpent's head when he died on the cross. And he put death and hell under his feet. He is the king. But no king could crush the head of the serpent. Actually, sometimes, unfortunately, kings are the seed of the serpent. Kings are sometimes. We pray for our leaders that they would not be evil people. But they might be. But we're talking about something, the context of our life is, is from the beginning of the human race all the way into eternity. At the end of our scriptures, we see a new heaven and a new earth, a new heavenly Jerusalem. We see a king, the king of kings, and we see a perfect world. Not only that, but everything wrong that's made right. We see evil removed from the world. We see the authority of this this incredible plan. Now, I want to say something about this book. If you can learn it, it'll help you relate to reality. You relate to God's world by faith, and you're connected with an invisible world. If your world is only the visible world, it's very limited. It's only your life. It's only your visible world. You're very limited. Because the, the key to life is more than what I can see. It's how I think and how I think in the context of what is revealed, what is being taught here, what is being said. What are we believing? We are believing in God. Believing in God is a beginning. Fear of God, fearing God is a beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is having the right proportions in life. I want to explain that for a minute. What do I mean? Insane people, use that word, and people insane, they don't have the right proportions in life. They don't, the unimportant things are important, and the important things, they don't get it. They don't see it. Um, I read an illustration about that from a preacher. He said, you know, he had a sick tree in his garden. The tree was diseased, and he was thinking how to help it and how to, how to, how to keep the tree alive and what to do about it. But then he had a sick child in the house. And he realized very simply, so it may be silly for you to think, but might help you understand. Insanity is when I lose my, my gri gri uh, grasp of reality and that the tree would be more important than my child. In insanity is when I cannot... Reality is escaping me and I maybe even invent... And I think in terms of things that aren't true, things that don't matter, things that are not valuable, things that are not important. And the point of God in your life is that he doesn't want you to be messed up in those things. He wants you to hit the right target. And he said it in many ways in the Gospels, like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be taken care of for you in Matthew 6. Make sure your eye is not evil. If your eye is evil, your whole body will be filled with darkness. Meaning, like, don't see the wrong thing or the thing out of proportion. 
but get it right. And God helps us. And by the way, when the crowd was taking, when the donkeys coming in and they put their coats and their cloaks down on the ground and on the donkey before Jesus got on it, and they're doing this, they are getting it right. They're like, got it. They got it. They're way ahead. They're right there with God in what God is doing. I would like to be like with that group. And I know you, you are, and, and we are, hopefully, but you follow what I mean. Because I think it's a dynamic thing in life that we are somehow walking in the spirit. God is renewing our mind, and we're saying, no, wait a minute, the tree is important to me. I love that tree. I don't want it to die, but I got something bigger, something more important. I got to bring my child to the hospital where I got to take care of him. I got to put money into helping. I need help for my child. My child is so important to me. So how do I get the right proportions in life? Follow Jesus. Jesus knows. Jesus knows. Another one would be somebody's money might be more important than people. What's more important? Like people, love. Like people that have needs, poor people. People that are in trouble, people that are looking for help, people that need faith, people that need the gospel, people that need to know that Jesus is real. We could be very much occupied with things out of proportion with what God is thinking and what God is saying to us. So this story about the donkey going into Jerusalem with the king riding on him, that some people are getting it and they are, they are understanding this is God. This is the seed of David. This is the one that's going to crush the serpent. This is the real king. This is the answer for life. This is the one that I worship. Now, so we have the first point is the crowd and the spirit anointing them. I believe that they didn't know exactly what they were doing, and it's written there. Let's put it up on the screen, 12, 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. They didn't know exactly what was happening. But it says in Zechariah 4, I'm sorry, uh, wait a minute, Zechariah 9, uh, let's uh, put that up there, please. Is, um, where is it, verse 6? Sorry about that, I have a little... Senior moment, maybe. Um, <laughs> Zechariah 9. 9-9, nine, nine, thank you. Okay, 9-9. Nine, nine. Rejoice greatly. Gra oh, da thank you. <laughs> Thou daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, how could, how could you be in that group? How could, how does it happen that you are with him and the spirit is moving and you are, he, he's coming, riding into the city uh, to fulfill the messianic promise not only of Genesis 3.15, but 2 Samuel 7.28, the king of David was told his seed would sit on the throne forever. Now, if you're a human being, you know that kings don't last forever. David, David's king, how can, a da how can a man sit on a throne forever unless he is God? And I once asked some uh, Orthodox Jews on the airplane one time coming from Europe, I, we had a talk. I said, can I sit next to you? We, they were young guys. 
and they were sweet guys, and we were talking. They were kind of cautious, but we had a nice talk. And 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 I said, what, they were talking. I said, what about the? Tell me about the Messiah and who is he and so on. And they, we talked a little bit. And I said, I have one question: Is the Messiah God? And they were like, like, and they look at each other and they're whispering and talking back and forth, you know. They, they don't want to get tricked, I think, by, you know. But it, it's not, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying it's a very good question. But it's so clear in the scripture. Right here, a son, a son is given unto us, a child is born, and his name shall be called Counselor, Right? Mighty God, wonderful counselor, prince of peace. He is, he is God. The Messiah, how could David, how could David say to his son, the Lord, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand? How could Yahweh say to Adonai, sit at my right hand, unless the seed of David is God? He is. And they stumbled at this stumbling stone. So we have the first group is the crowd, and I like to think that you and I are in that crowd. I want you and I to be in the crowd recognizing him as the Messiah. I want you to know the spirit of God in you. I really want you to have experience with God. That's very important in your life. I want you to sense the life of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God in your heart. That's very important. I want you to be waving palm branches and going nuts and saying hallelujah, hosanna to God. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, right? I want that. I want you to have that in your life. If you don't have it, Wait upon God and get it. God gives it to you. You believe him and walk by faith in him, and it will happen in your life. It will. It will happen in your life. You'll know Jesus, and Jesus, you just say, you know, we don't know exactly what's going on here. The disciples said, it says that. They didn't know exactly what it meant and what was going on, but later, after the resurrection, after he had a glorified body, they remembered it. That's verse uh, <clears throat> that's uh, twelve nineteen. Is it up there? On the sixteen, I mean twelve sixteen. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. Okay. Next point: the city. The city of Jerusalem, the people in charge, the Pharisees, the religious institutions, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, the blood sacrifices, the Passover, the city. They're going along their way. They're on their route of religious action and behavior, and the city is filled with people, pilgrims that came up for the Passover. They don't get it. They don't know what's going on. And even to the point where some the leaders had decided on this event, because of this and the raising of Lazarus from the dead, that the whole world is going after Christ and they have to kill him. That's in chapter 12, verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive you how you prevail nothing, Behold, the world is gone after him. There is the spirit and the seed of the devil that wants to destroy him. And the contest is starting to emerge. There is the, the world there, the city, we can call it the city of Jerusalem, and the religious order and the pride, the activity, the knowledge, and actually the traditions that are in Orthodox Judaism, the traditions, and they are precious. I'm not saying anything about it, but I want to bring your attention to something. When, when the city has a temple, 
and they have a priesthood, and they have blood sacrifices. When Jesus goes into the city and he sees it, what do you think he's thinking? What is Christ thinking? He could think this way. You see that temple? It's not enough for the whole world. It's not enough for the Koreans and the Russians and the Indians and the Africans and the Latinos. That temple, that building is not enough. I am. I am the temple. I am. I am the, actually, I am the one that it all is built on me. I am the rock or the cornerstone that God has ordained. And upon me, there is a temple that is built made up of people throughout all time. And I am, I am the answer. It sounds very proud or arrogant, but it isn't. It's just the truth. Christ is the temple. He's, now he's standing in the temple. And then he looks at the blood of the sacrifice, and what does he think? That blood of an animal is not enough. It's not enough to save a soul. It has to be my blood. I'm the answer. Then he looks at a priest over there to the left. He's in the, he's in the temple, and he's looking around, because it says it in the scripture. He went in, and he looked around. What did he see? He saw a religion that, in effect, is dead. But he is there as the fulfillment of it. He is, the, he is the priest that is going to go. Where is he going to go? Where is Christ going to go as a priest? Into heaven itself. How does he go there? He goes there with his own blood. What is he building? A temple that has no end. He will sit on a throne that will have no end. He is the answer for all that Judaism presented and all that it is in itself. It was not enough for the world because it was only a model for us to follow, to understand the deeper reality that is invisible. Where the blood of Christ is not visible to us today. It is invisible, but the effect of it is real. The kingship of Christ is not visible to today, but his authority is uh, real in our life. And he's an intercessor and a priest for us. The city didn't know this. The city didn't know, and he wept over the city in Luke 19, 41. And he understood that these people don't get it out of proportion. They're out of proportion that they're saying, you know, this is like we do it in our own religion. We might say burning a candle is very important. And God will say, give me your heart. Walk by faith and trust me. We might might say, you know, my good works in this way is critically important for me to go to heaven. And God said, you never go to heaven by good works. You need the blood of Jesus to justify you and save you and give to you the, the Holy Spirit is what, is what we need in our life and salvation by grace and understanding grace. That's the key. That's the right. It's, there's proportions there that we think, to, we think about and relate to. Okay. Third one, the donkey. You know, animals don't like you to get on top of them. Did you know that? When I was a little boy, I got on top of a dog. <laughs> he didn't like it. How about get on top of uh, like any kind of animal? Like animals are like, get off of me. Get off of me. Horses included. Donkeys included. And by the way, when Jesus got on that donkey, it says in the scripture, that donkey had never been ridden before. And I want to act that out a little bit. When when they put Jesus on that donkey, the donkey goes, I'm with you. Game on. Let's go. It'd be so easy. Get off me. Everybody's on me. Nobody's going to get on me. Get off me. No, he didn't. Because the kingdom of God, I said it. Now, listen. It's invisible, but it's very practical. 
It's invisible, but that doesn't mean it is meaningless. It's meaningful. Christ has authority over that donkey. And otherwise, he would throw him off or put up a fuss or kick and whatever they do, hee-haw, whatever, I don't know. But they are not like animals don't like it. But, you know, the authority of Christ in your life is a real thing. Uh, he can give you peace. The authority of Christ in your life it has an effect on you. That, that you would worry at night, but you don't anymore. Because the authority of Christ, he is the king of kings. Yeah, knows where you're living, knows what you need. He is able to overcome every instinct, every bit of anxiety, everything that we fear. Christ, this Holy Spirit power is a very real thing. And when, that, when, they, when, when, they, when they're coming and the donkey is going, like, uh, I mean, I just like to think that the animal kingdom recognizes, and there are like historical stories, you know, about Ken, uh, Francis of Assisi talking to the birds and, and birds coming and landing on his arms. And I like to think of um, uh, animals and how much they're afraid of us. And George Woodfield said um, something like, uh, animals are afraid of us because they know that we are against their master. Their master is God. And we are an enemy of God. And they don't trust us. You know, I like to play around with that idea. I, I think that the natural world that we live in is a real thing that God has the authority over, that he sends angels to deliver us. He helps us with an anointed life. We have peace when other people are in trouble and in despair and are afraid, and we have some uh, relationship with the world that we live in where we are ministers of Christ. We help ministries of Christ. We diffuse problems. We love, we learn to edify and help. And even the animals may recognize that. And that's what the donkey means to me, us today. Fourth and lastly, the king. There's no king like this one. There's nobody like him who is humble, who is God, 100% God, 100% man, the seed of the woman, the seed of David, who has this authority, and he is recognized by God the Father as the king, the crown of his creation, the crown of all things that have ever existed, the highest, most noble, the greatest thing that could have ever happened was that he was offered up for us so that we would be God's children and that God would continually give us favor, never fail us, never leave us, always know us, and always care for us. How low could Christ be as a king, so weak and so low? But that's the one we're looking for. And that's the one that we discern and recognize to be the one that will reign and rule over the whole universe kind of in the future. And in that context, the beginning all the way to the coming of Christ, we know that, that when he comes back, one writer said, he will come back in the air with the, with the saints, and it'll take time as he passes in the atmosphere, maybe circling around. Every eye will see him, and we, they will, the world will recognize, because the world will come near to destruction, but in his coming back, he will save the human race from total annihilation. And every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. 
And this all sounds too fantastic, but it isn't. It isn't for me. I, I mean, I, I'm learning to enjoy it, appreciate it, recognize it, and also anticipate it. Because in my heart, I want a king. Do you know, like people in our society, like kings aren't in, you know, like kings aren't, like we don't want to have kings. Like Euro Europeans can have kings and, and Asia can have kings, but we don't want, we're Americans. We don't want a king. But then we have them. They're called celebrities, professors, athletes. We, we want people to be big, powerful, important. They are billionaires. Americans have kinks. They, we are made for like honoring somebody. Uh, somebody better than us, somebody bigger than us, somebody richer than us, somebody has, smarter than us. We're kind of made. We, we'd like to see, like, who is that? Who is that? I, I don't think many of you have though, that, those in, in your life because you've got the greatest king, and you're happy with him. You got somebody that's worth worshiping, Amen. We got somebody who did it. They didn't just talk about it, but he did it. We got somebody who came into this miserable world and looked at it all right in the face and said, I will take you on. And he crushed this serpent's head and he rose, he rose from the dead and he hung out for 40 days teaching I'm bringing to their minds everything that is written in here about the Messiah, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, if not even thousands of things that relate to the Messiah. And he said, and I'm gonna go, and you guys are in charge. I am with you, go low, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Command, I to teach them everything I have commanded you, and preach the gospel to everyone, and I am with you in it all. Do you feel that? I mean, this is a good question. Do you ever feel this, that you're on the right side of things? Do you ever, are you, like the whole city is against this thing, but we're not. We're like, do you ever feel that in your spirit and in your heart, you got it right? The Lord got it right for you. That actually, this is true. That he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Do you ever feel? I hope you do. And if you, if you don't yet, can't keep on. And keep on. You will feel it. And it will come stronger and stronger to you. Because God wants you to know. And then afterwards, you might recall it in your mind and go, yeah, hey, remember? I was on the right side of things in that thing. Remember that? I went to the church, and this is what happened. Or I went, I, I did a, a mission, and that was amazing. Or I said, I called up somebody and said, please forgive me. And I was on the right side of things in that thing, and I found Jesus in my heart alive, and, and I found out that, that this is the kingdom of God is on the earth and amongst us today. Beautiful. Amen. Lord Jesus, that donkey could have said, get off of me, but he didn't. I'm sure he enjoyed it. It's a big deal. In heaven was great. They saw in heaven the Messiah enter the city on the colt, as the prophet said. We're here today too. Maybe sometimes there's not like great great things that we could point to, but there are maybe subtle and small things that we are in his will. He is giving all of us great grace. 
We are walking by faith and experiencing God in the world. Help us to have the right proportion on things. Help us to live in your reality and find it and know it and trust you. To think with you, Lord. Maybe somebody listening, you haven't yet started your life in Christ. Today's the day for you. Today's the day for you to say to Jesus, I, I put my trust in you. Forgive me of my sins and turn me from my own way, my evil way, my way, my life, my way, my way, my life, my way for me and what I want. I will, I decide today to, to believe in you and ask you to lead, be my guide and my leader, my savior, my king. Start today. Say yes to Jesus. In Jesus' name. Anybody saying that prayer? Yes to Jesus for the first time? Just raise your hand. Anyone here in the auditorium? Anybody? Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Beautiful. Awesome. God bless you. Pray that that will happen this week in the play all through the week and for the altar call and the urging of people, urging people to believe and trust in Jesus. Walk by faith in him and pray to him. He will answer you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. At the end of the service, if the greater grace pastors could just come forward right now. I think, do we have a song? I don't know. Do we? I guess not. Right, Pastor? Okay. So um, then Pastor Eugene will dismiss you. Okay. Um, so as the pastors come down, if you have any prayer needs, these pastors are here. Um, let's all stand as we close in the benediction. Um, Father, we, mm, Lord, we say Hosanna in our hearts. Thank you for this word, timely message for us. Mm, Father, we are, our lives in light of your plan, what you're doing on this earth, Lord. Just help us to spend times in our Bibles. Bring us back again often to hear your word to fellowship with each other, things we heard this morning, this week, Lord, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Bring many, many, many people, Lord. It's just your plan of redemption is unfold on this stage. God, give us sensitivity today to not allow the things we heard be taken from us, but to meditate often. Bring us back tonight, 6.30, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Thank you, Father. Cover our day for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.